So on this page, we've already ranked and explained all of the Black Clover magical captains. And considering the fact that the Black Clover manga is in a time skip era right now, where everybody is differently powered after a battle against the Dark Triad, the placements of people's powers in respect to each other has had a little bit of a shift. And thus people spam me with a bunch of comments asking me to rank and explain black bulls which is understandable because in the manga all of the black bulls had a myriad of different feats and these feats put certain black bulls members over other black bulls members that might have been under each other before but more than anything i want this video to serve as an introduction to the black bulls members and where they are at currently so with no further ado let's get into the black bulls ranked and explained but before we get to ranking or explaining anything guys please for me like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. I'd like to open this video by saying that there is no member of the Black Bulls that is weak. And I love every single one of these members. Except for number 15, which is Ghosh. Ghosh Adelaide is everything I hate about this show, and luckily for me, he's also the weakest member of the Black Bulls. Can we just, as a society, drop the sister love thing? I just, we don't need it in anime. It's weird, it makes me uncomfortable, she's significantly underage. Ghosh, outside of the whole, you know, sister love thing, is actually a pretty interesting character. Ghosh was born to a noble family. However, Ghosh's parents were killed in an accident that had a different noble end up inheriting all of Ghosh and Marie's wealth, leading to Ghosh and Marie being cast out of their own home as orphans. And because of this, Ghosh did anything he could to protect Marie. However, in order to keep Marie fed, Ghosh has to get into a life of crime. And one night, Ghosh tries to break into a noble's household to steal things, but is caught and sent to prison, which leads to Marie being sent to an orphanage. However, after a certain amount of time in prison, Ghosh breaks out. However, after breaking out, he's caught by Yami, who naturally just asks him to join the the Black Bulls, but that's who Yami is. Ghosh, while he might have seemed like a relative gag character in the beginning, has actually gotten pretty strong. You see, Ghosh uses mirror magic, which while usually is used to reflect attacks or shoot beams of light at his enemies, Ghosh has found a way to make physical copies of either himself or somebody else or really anything using his mirror magic. And he's used this ability to make second Astas or second himselves, which effectively doubles his battle power. However, it doesn't stop at just one copy. In the Dark Triad arc, we actually saw Ghosh make multiple copies of Charmy so she could trans mute all of Morris's tendrils away. We also saw him do this with Asta with his move called Mirror's Brigade. On top of this, Ghosh actually has a magical tool embedded into his eye. It's a mirror magical tool that allows him to augment the power of his spells. Outside of his mirror magic, Ghosh is also a noble, and thus was born with a high level of magical prowess, meaning he has more magical power than a lot of the other black bulls who are peasants. On top of this, Ghosh was taken over by an elf, and even though the elf's possession is over, some of the elven magic sticks with Ghosh, which gave him an additional power-up. But enough of about Ghosh, let's talk about a character I actually love, and that would be Gordon Agrippa. You see, we're all well aware that Gordon's best boy. This shy goth king has been living in the background of the Black Bulls hideout for as long as we've known the Black Bulls. Gordon was born to the Agrippa family, a family of commoners known for their cursed magic. But because of the fact that Gordon uses cursed magic and the fact that he looks like a goth clown, Gordon couldn't make any friends as a child, which is why when he actually got his grimoire, he abandoned the town he grew up with to join the Black Bulls, which is actually unheard of within the Agrippa family because most of the Agrippas just stayed at the Agrippa family compound and use their cursed magic to make money. While Gordon, much like Ghosh, also seemed like a gag character, we've seen a lot more in terms of power from Gordon than we have seen Ghosh. You see, during the six month time skip, Gordon figured out how to make his poison magic actually heal. So now not only can Gordon use poison magic against enemies, he can change his poison into medicine to boost the abilities of his allies. But his abilities actually go beyond this. You see, we saw in the Dark Triad arc that Gordon had an ability called the Curse Worker's Neighbor. With this ability, Gordon is able to manipulate a curse that's placed on somebody. That is to say, if curse magic has been used against Gordon or somebody near Gordon, Gordon can manipulate said curse to work better for either himself or the person that's been cursed near him. He used this ability on Henry, who was cursed to drain the magical power from anybody he's near. But Gordon altered his curse using this ability to allow Henry to choose who he drains magical power from. And considering that all curse magic hails from Magicula, a devil, having complete control over curse magic and those it's been applied to is an insanely powerful ability. So Gordon can not only use curse and poison magic to make offensive abilities like Afwachin Dotch, which in English means wake up badgers that allows him to make sentient badgers that he can use to attack people. Sentient badgers made of poison, mind you. But he can also control curses on people to be more advantageous for himself and convert his poison magic into medicine to heal his allies. On top of this, we saw him get into the deepest parts of the high monozone volcano that Mara Leona likes to train in. And in order to access this area, he had to use mana skin, which means to some degree, Gordon has mastered monozone. But enough about our best boy, let's get to the next entry on this list. Magna. 
Now I know what you're saying. Magna beat Dante in a fight. How is he 13th out of 15? Well, one, all of the Black Bulls are very powerful, and two, we spent six months making a rune arraignment so we could fight Dante on a level basis. Not exactly an ability he can bust out whenever he wants. But we're not quite there yet. Who is Magna? Magna is a commoner, just like Gordon. And he was born in a village called Ryaka. As a commoner born in a relatively backwater village, it was never really a possibility for him to become a magical knight. But Magna was a delinquent dedicated to getting his fire magic as strong as possible so one day he could join the magical knights. Yami seeing this delinquent who much mirrored his own childlike personality decided to take Magna to the Black Bulls. Magna for a long time has been regarded as one of the weaker members of the Black Bulls. Even when he took Asta and Noel on their first mission on his broomstick, we could see that his magical control wasn't that good. Hell, one of the first things that Asta ever does is reflect Magna's fireball right back at Magna. And while obviously Asta at the moment had anti-magic, the fact that Asta could react to said fireball and launch it back at Magna perfectly kind of implies that Magna wasn't that strong to begin with. But just because Magna started out weak doesn't mean that he can't end up strong. You see, after Asta had his arms broken and cursed, all of the Black Bulls went to go look for a cure for his arms. And Magna and Luck went to a high mana zone dungeon. And there's actually a light novel about this trip to the dungeon that if you love Black Clover, I highly recommend you read. But within the confines of this dungeon, both Magna and Luck are kind of pushed into a corner by very, very high level opponents. High level opponents that canonically Yami has fought and struggled with prior. Now, obviously we're not talking about Dark Triad. Yami here was a much younger earlier on Yami, but still Yami. And while within the confines of this dungeon, Magna and Luck don't find the cure for Asta's arms, they come back significantly significantly stronger. This dungeon experience can be likened to Mariliona training within a volcano to make her mana skin stronger. By traipsing through a very high mana zone filled with very powerful enemies, both Luck and Magna got significantly stronger. But this isn't where Magna's training ends. See, obviously while getting ready to battle the devils, there's a time where everybody in the Black Bulls goes to train in their own certain way. Asta brings Magna and Luck to train with Gaja in the Heart Kingdom. And while Luck is able to pick up the use of runes relatively quickly, Magna can't. But with the help of Zora who uses rune arrays to make traps, Magna, over the course of six months, begins to understand rune arrays. And after six months, Magna is able to make something called the Soul Chain. See, if Magna hits somebody with the Soul Chain, a Soul Chain deathmatch begins, where the magical power between the two people connected via the Soul Chain equalize in power. The way that it's depicted is that if Dante's magical power is a thousand, and Magna's is two, that both of them would get 501 power, making them equal in power. And it's at this point that they enter a all-out fists brawl. An all-out fist brawl that Magna wins against Dante. But this rune array took him six months to create. So while the fact that he was able to almost kill one of the Dark Triad is very impressive, it's not really something we can give him credit to do multiple times. I say almost kill because Dante gets back up later, Jack the Ripper just finishes the job. But since we were talking about the people who trained Magna, next up is Zora. See, Zora Zora has an incredibly complicated and very sad backstory. Zora is the son of Zara, a peasant whose only dream was to become a magical knight. So much so that Zara subjected himself to the magical knight selection exam every single year until eventually he was brought onto the purple orcas. And while he wasn't necessarily the strongest member of the purple orcas, he was proud to be a magical knight. That was until one day that Zara was killed during a mission. But he wasn't killed on this mission by an enemy. He was killed on this mission by his teammate. His teammates who wanted him off the purple orcas because he was a commoner associating with nobles. And thus Zora began his hunt for said corrupted magical nobles. And thus Zora committed his entire life to finding corrupt magical knights and killing them. And while he was on these missions, he was stumbled upon by Yami, who offered him a spot on the Black Bulls. And while he accepts his position, he never wears his cloak. And he continues on his mission of hunting down corrupt magical knights. Now, when Zora was introduced, he seemed as though he would be one of the stronger characters in the Black Bulls. And while he is by no means week. Unfortunately, he really just hasn't received a lot of the scaling that other Black Bulls have. You see, Zora uses trap magic, which essentially means he uses rune arrays to make traps that people can either fall into that can reflect magical attacks or that just kill you. And what these traps do or how powerful they are is entirely dependent upon Zora. What runes does he have time to put into the trap? How long does he have to make the trap? See, Zora's battle IQ is very high. He ascertains what's going to go on through a battle and lures people into places where he has traps drawn. However, his magic does take a fair amount of prep because while he is able to draw traps very quickly, those traps aren't powerful. In order to use his most powerful magic, he either A, has to have somebody there to keep the heat off him, or B, has to lure somebody into some place that he sent up more complicated traps. But that's not to say that his quick traps aren't incredibly powerful as well. In fact, when it was first revealed to us that Zora was a member of the Black Bulls, he reflected one of Mary Leona's attacks 
back at her. And this was with a trap that wasn't previously laid out. But in the Dark Triad arc, we saw truly what Zora could accomplish with a complicated rune array. You see, Zora, when going into the battle against the Dark Triad, covered himself in a secret trap counter magic. And this secret trap counter magic would take in any magic that was dealt against him, double it, and then redirect it back out as magical output against whoever hit him with it. Zora uses this ability against Lucifero. Zora is essentially teleported to in front of Lucifero to take his punch, using Vanessa's Rouge ability. Then after taking Lucifero's punch, the counter magic is activated, and Zora doubles the power of said punch into his right fist and goes to punch Lucifero. Lucifero then counters out this punch with his own punch, but since Zora was using union magic with Sekere, Sekere is able to bind Lucifero for a second. And on top of trap magic and union magic, Zora is actually able to use ash magic. His ash magic ability called Revelation of the Cowardly is able to expose where traps have been laid. He uses this ability to show his allies where his traps are for two reasons, so they don't fall into them and also so they can lure their enemies into them. But since we're talking about union magic, next up we have Sekirei, everyone's favorite couple thousand year old bird girl. Sekirei was born into a noble family. However, because Sekirei was born with supposedly useless magic, she was kind of disregarded by her family and thus she was assigned to be a royal servant to the person who would then become the first wizard king, Lemiel Silvamillion Clover. And thus Sekirei was right beside the first wizard king as he battled against Zagred 500 years ago. And she was actually the person who sealed Zagred using the magical stones 500 years ago. However, because Sekirei used the magical stones and therefore forbidden magic, she actually became an anti-bird. Because if you use too much forbidden magic, your body changes. And as an anti-bird, she follows Ostra around almost for the entirety of the story. It isn't until the magical stones are placed in a tablet that are then placed on the first wizard king statue that Sekirei is released from her bird form. And it's at that point that her and the first wizard king help in the battle against Leek in the elves. And after this battle, she's invited to join the Black Bulls, which was a good idea by Yami, considering the fact that Sekirei is our first arcane level mage on this list. See, Sekirei has the ability Sealing Magic, which was considered useless by her family because as far as they understood it, it could only be used to open and close objects or spells. However, as Sekirei lived with the first Wizard King, she realized that there was a lot more that could be done with Sealing Magic than just opening and closing things. Sekirei realizes that she can seal people into things. Like how Sekure was able to seal the first wizard king into a statue for 500 years. She can then also release people from these things. That is, of course, unless she uses her ability Eternal Prison, which is a sealing spell that traps a target for centuries. However, none of this is really the reason that Sekure is an arcane stage mage. You see, in order to become an arcane stage mage, you can have any magical ability. However, if you use your magical ability in a new and different and powerful way, you become an arcane stage mage. And the way that Sekure Sekirei achieved this is by turning her sealing magic into healing magic. See, Sekirei is able to seal off injuries. If you were to hypothetically get a huge gash on your chest, she could seal the gash. She can also seal off somebody's exhaustion or reseal somebody's limb onto their body. And this is without considering the fact that she can use forbidden magic to boost her magical affinity even higher. But since we're talking about people who take long naps, next up on our list is number 10, Henry. See, Henry, like Sekirei, is also a noble. However, because he was born with a strange illness that siphons magic from those around him, his family was forced to move to a secluded house in the commoner realm. And eventually, one day, his parents just left him. And since Henry can't leave this house for fear of siphoning magic from those around him and killing them, and this strange disease keeps him alive by siphoning magical power from those around him, and now there's nobody around him, Henry is near death. And this is how Yami finds him. And Yami, being Yami, recruits him to the Black Bulls, which is kind of the perfect place for Henry to be. See, Henry gets stronger the more strong magic that's around him. And the more strong magicians that are around him and the more magic Henry is pulling into himself, the stronger his own magic becomes. But what is his magic? Well, it's recombination magic. That is to say that Henry can change the shape and size of something he is very familiar with. Most people believe that this only applies to his magical house, the Black Bull's hideout. However, this isn't necessarily true. Anything that Henry has spent a significant amount of time with and thus has seeped his magic into, he can change the shape and size of. It's just because Henry can't really leave the Black Bull's hideout he only ever uses as magic on the Black Bull's hideout, which he has done to insane effect. Obviously, the fact that Henry can turn the Black Bull's hideout into a giant mechanized bull to fight people is insane to begin with. Offensively, it pretty much puts him above anybody else on this list thus far. And we've seen some pretty insane feats from Henry. In the Dark Triad arc, we saw all of the Black Bulls gather together in an extra large cockpit. And because all of the Black Bulls were so close to Henry, Henry was able to make the ultra big bull, a bull that was able to, for a little bit, fight a 
against Lucifero after merging with all of the demons that emerged from the second level of hell. Henry is able to deliver a blow straight to Lucifero's face and tries to reach into a mound of demons that are slowly forming Lucifero's evolved body to grab Yami and William Vengeance out of it. However, Lucifero uses gravity magic to increase the gravity in the area which destroys the Black Bull's hideout's arms. But Henry and the Black Bull's hideout are able to withstand this increased gravity. And this isn't even the first time that Henry shows off a feat like this. In the battle against Dante at 60% of his power, Dante uses gravity magic against Henry, which Henry was able to resist. Which is insane when you consider the fact that Henry's physical strength is actually given a 1 in the data book out of 5. Meaning that basically everything that was keeping him standing against Dante's gravity magic was his own magical power. So while Henry may not be the first Black Bull you think of when you think Black Bulls, he's one of the stronger ones. And that trend absolutely continues with the next entry on our list, Grey. See, Grey is the symbol of animinity within the Black Bulls. In fact, we don't even know Grey's real name. Grey was born in the common realm of the Clover Kingdom and lives a very Cinderella life. You see, Grey's father remarries, and he remarries a woman with two daughters already, and thus, and thus they become Grey's stepsisters. However, Grey's stepmother and stepsisters are incredibly cruel to Grey and make her do all of the household chores, all the while critiquing her for how she looks. After Grey receives her grimoire, though, she shows off her magic to her stepsisters, mirroring the appearance of her stepsisters. Her stepsisters are appalled by this and drive her out of the house. And as Grey flees from her house, three men attempt to rob her. And it's at this point that Ghosh saves her. And after being saved by Ghosh, Yami invites her to join the Black Bulls. For a long time, Grey seemed like a gag character, the overly timid, overly shy person who was always dressed as somebody else. For the first half of the show, we didn't even know what Grey's true appearance was. However, she gained more confidence and we began to see more of Grey's true form. Her abilities also got significantly stronger. Because here's the thing about Grey, she uses a little thing called transmutation magic. A magic that allows her to disassemble something and reassemble it into something entirely different. Meaning that Grey basically has complete mastery over everything on Earth. She can take a rose and turn it into a lily. She can take glasses and turn them into a ruler. She can take a human and turn them into a dog. If Grey gets her hands on you, she can basically erase you from existence. Hey, she doesn't have to turn you into something living and sentient. She can turn you into human chili. And the wild thing is Grey can also do this to magic. We saw Grey disassemble the magic of Morris, one of the pseudo members of the Dark Triad. She simply transmuted the magic that was being shot at her and turned it into plants. I mean that hypothetically as long as Grey can get her hands on the magic that's being shot at her, she can get rid of it, giving her pseudo anti-magic abilities. And because Grey can permanently change non-magical entities, she's considered an arcane stage mage. And because she has mastery over essentially the assembly of atoms, she can use her transmutation magic to heal people. Let's say you get stabbed through the stomach like ghost, she can simply put flesh where flesh is no longer and then you're fine. On top of that, she also has her transformation magic, which is what allows her to make herself or anybody else look like something else. Now, now, this isn't like transmutation magic. It doesn't physically make that person or that thing into the thing it looks like. That person or that thing just looks like the thing that she makes it look like. And while the average user of transformation magic is only able to use this on themselves, Grey can use it on other people or other things, giving her another vote for being an arcane stage mage. But since we're talking about pseudo support characters with insane abilities, next up on our list is Vanessa. Now, having Vanessa this high is probably controversial because if we're looking at her from like a sheer feats perspective, she really hasn't accomplished like a crazy amount, but I'm scaling her off potential, especially considering the fact that some of the abilities that she was given access to several hundred chapters ago with Rouge are now being used to scale people like Brill to an incredibly high level because Brill got access to an ability that allows him to essentially make a garden that makes everybody invincible for as long as the garden is active, which is basically what Rouge's ability does. See, Vanessa is a witch and therefore was born in the witch's forest. And after being born, she quickly became one of the favorites of the witch queen. And this wasn't great for Vanessa because the witch queen saw in a prophecy that Vanessa would gain control over fate and consequences. And thus the Witch Queen caged Vanessa and told her to improve her magic to get access to this control over fate and consequences. And this is where Vanessa stays until Yami breaks into the Witch's forest and accidentally breaks into Vanessa's prison, where he tells her to ignore fate and do whatever she wants. So she does whatever she wants and joins the Black Bulls. Now Vanessa is the epitome of a support character, but an incredibly powerful one at that. See, we've seen Vanessa support the Black Bulls in a myriad of ways. She's used her thread magic in combination with Fenrir's teleportation magic to increase Asta's mobility against Veto. She's used her thread magic to hold people in place so the rest of the Black Bulls could attack. But more than anything recently, we've seen Vanessa use her Rouge ability, which is a thread magic ability that allows her to create a red cat that can control fate and consequences. That is to say that anybody that Vanessa considers close, and this usually 
only applies to the Black Bulls, can have the concept of fate and consequences always swing to their side. Essentially meaning that Vanessa can rewrite reality. Let's say a sword is hurtling towards my chest. If I'm under Rouge's protection, the sword will miss me. And Rouge can accomplish this through a myriad of ways. It can get rid of the sword or move my body or have the sword fall short of me. Rouge rewrites fate in order to best serve the Black Bulls. And this ability is so powerful that Dante, when he attacked the Black Bulls hideout, saw Vanessa using it and offered her to join him. Because here's the thing, as long as you have Vanessa with enough magical power on your side, you're basically unkillable. And in fact, we saw Vanessa in the Dark Triad arc use this ability to make sure that Zoro would get punched by Lucifero's hit so he could use his trap spell to attack Lucifero with two times the power. So while technically Vanessa doesn't get very much stronger after the time skip and into the Dark Triad arc, Rouge's ability to play with the circumstances of fate and make sure that everybody around her, including herself, survives a fight is always going to be insanely powerful. Unless, of course, you take into consideration what Morris said about devil boosted powers and how devil boosted powers can play with intangible concepts, meaning that Rouge's protection didn't necessarily apply against devil boosted powers. But since we're talking about people that are really good at moving off the very quickly, next up on our list is Finral. See, Finral was born into a noble family, House Vod, known for its spatial magic. In a year after Finral was born, his mother died. However, his father remarried and had a son with the second wife, and that boy is known as Longris. And as these two boys grow up side by side, Finral's abilities are overshadowed by Longris's. But even though Finral's abilities are overshadowed by Longris's, that doesn't mean Finral's not strong enough to join a magical night squad. And thus, eventually, he's recruited by Yami to join the Black Bulls. You see, Finral, for a large part of Black Clover, was simply a teleportation mechanic for Yami to go to the bathroom. However, as time progresses, Finral's relationship with Longris pushes him to get stronger. Because Finral considers himself a coward, but he sees the bravery and commitment to getting stronger amongst the Black Bulls and his younger brother Longris. And this is reflected in the way that Finral battles. See, like I said in the beginning, Finral is only good for opening portals to the bathroom. However, Finral quickly learned that his abilities could be used to help his teammates in combat. As Finral opened a multitude of different portals around enemies to allow his teammates to jump through these portals to get surprise attacks on said enemies. But as we get to arcs like the Witch's Forest arc, we see Finral begin to even further develop his fighting style. You see, Finral and the Black Bulls are attacked by the security golems that protect the Witch's Forest. And so Finral creates two portals to protect them from the magical bullets being shot at them, essentially using one portal to pull the bullets in and the other to shoot them back. And we see Finral take another step forward in the Magical Knight games, when Finral is pitted against his brother Longris. It's at this point that Finral uses the ability Fallen Angel Flapping for the first time, where he launches a portal at an enemy that forcibly teleports them to somewhere else, like the Black Bull's hideout's toilet. But Finral's truest abilities were shown in the Dark Triad arc, where Finral and Longris teamed up to fight Xenon, one of the Dark Triad, where Longris uses his offensive spatial magic and Finral uses his defensive spatial magic, which is taken on the likes of Yuno and William Vengeance. And technically, Finral and Longris would have won because Finral was able to teleport to a blind spot of Xenon's and Longris was able to use an offensive spatial magic spell to take out Xenon's heart. However, spatial magic cannot teleport a devil's heart and thus Longris and Finral lose. But technically, because of the rules of how a devil heart works, there was never a win state for them in the first place. So the fact that Finral is able to react to the bone whip of one of the Dark Triads at full devil power, mind you, while operating within Longris's mana zone is an insanely powerful feat. On top of this, Finral learned mana method in the Heart Kingdom that allows him to use arrays to increase his speed, specifically the speed of the activation of his spells, which is why he was able to dodge Xenon's bone whips. But enough about Finral, right? We gotta talk about the next person on the list who has the most perplexing following of all time, Charmy. Yes, that's right, I'm looking directly at you, Charmy Army. We don't actually really know Charmy's backstory. Charmy just kind of finds her caught in a trap and then she just gets recruited to the Black Bulls. That's literally, that's that's it. Which is weird when we consider the fact that Charmy is one of the more perplexing characters in the Black Bulls because she's quite literally one of the only cases of a dual raced person in Black Clover. See, Charmy is half dwarf, half human, which is why she has two forms, her little form and then I guess her less little form. But because Charmy technically has two races, she also has two different magic affinities, making her one of two people with that ability? The other being Yuna? I could absolutely be wrong about it being only two people. Don't take my word for that. But even if there is more than just Charmy and Yuna, it's still very rare. You see, Charmy has access to cotton magic, 
and food magic. Two inherently very different magic types. See, with Charmy's cotton magic, she can control and manipulate cotton, which she can use to do a myriad of different things. She can make sheep cooks who cook food, or she can make giant cushions that are able to float and fly her team. She can make giant sheep cushions that cushion the impact of blows. Say one of her teammates gets punched very hard and is gonna fly into a hard building, she can make a cushion to stop that. She can also use an ability called sheep bondage, which is a restraining magic that uses her cotton magic. She can also make giant cotton sheep mech that can fight for her, very similar to Henry's ability to make the Black Bull hideout into a giant bull mech. However, on top of her cotton magic, Charmy also trained in the Heart Kingdom, where she learned the ability to tap into natural mana. And by tapping into natural mana, Charmy now has the ability to generate and manipulate real cotton. On top of her cotton magic, Charmy also has food magic, which allows her to do a myriad of things. One, it allows her to imbue magic into food that she cooks, meaning that anybody who eats this food will instantly have their magic reserves filled. On top of that, she has an ability called Glutton's Banquet that summons a giant wolf with a fork and a knife that can eat spells and siphon the magic of those spells to Charmy. And her mana method teachings don't only apply to her cotton magic, they also apply to her food magic, allowing her to use her food magic to create barriers that trap an enemy and allow them to be cooked. On top of this, because she's half dwarf and dwarfs have incredibly high magical power, Charmy can tap into insane reserves of magical power. She's just got to be angry or hungry enough. And we see that Charmy is so talented in her mana method that she uses it in combination with her cotton magic during the Dark Triad arc to absolutely wipe the floor with low ranking devils. Not to mention without her food magic, making sure that the Black Bulls have magic for their fights, they all would have been decimated long ago. But speaking of decimation, the next entry on our list is is luck. You see, luck's favorite thing to do is to decimate things. He inherently just enjoys combat. See, luck is most likely a sociopath in that he displays almost next to no emotions. The only emotion that luck really knows how to convey is joy, which is fortunate for everybody else. The only time we've ever seen luck stop smiling is when Longris tried to kill Finral. You see, luck has an obsession with defeating his opponents, specifically alone. Luck doesn't like assistance in his battles. That was until Asta joined the Black Bulls. You see, luck was born a commoner in the common realm in a town called Yvonne. And while he spent the majority of his childhood with his mother, his mother wasn't his biggest fan because Luck and his relentless smile kind of creeped her out. However, once Luck defeated a noble in a magical battle, his mother started to show him affection, which created a positive feedback loop for Luck that victory meant love. And before that positive feedback loop, could be set in any other direction, Luck's mother dies. And thus, Luck is constantly pursuing combat in victory in order to receive love. And because Luck was always trying to find combat, it made sense for him to try and join the Magical Knight squads. However, in the last part of the Magical Knight exams, Luck almost kills his opponent, which leads none of the Magical Knight captains interested outside of Yami, who understands that that might be useful somewhere down the line. You see, Luck uses lightning magic, but he's so much more than just a lightning mage. See, while we've always known that Luck is one of the stronger members of the Black Bulls, the time skip was very good to him. You see, Luck had always used his lightning magic to code his entire body to increase his speed and power. And this was referred to as Thunder Feet, where Luck covered his hands and feet in lightning. However, Luck, like a lot of the other Black Bulls, also went to the Heart Kingdom to learn true magic. And therefore, Luck, much like Gaja, is now able to summon and control real lightning, which is significantly stronger than magic-generated lightning. And with this newfound ability, Luck found a new technique, Lightning Battle Fiend, where Luck covers his entire body in real lightning. Combine this with the fact that Luck was taken over by an elf, Lufulu, and once the elf was exercised from his body, it left some of the elven magic within his body, increasing all of his techniques. And you have an insanely powerful mage, a mage who scales to Gaja's level, if not higher. And Gaja, mind you, is an arcane stage mage and considered one of the strongest mages in the Heart Kingdom, if not the strongest mage, except for like maybe Lola Peshka. And with this new technique, Lightning Battle Fiend, Luck showed some crazy feats during the Dark Triad arc. Luck speed blitz in one shot a myriad of Dark Disciples. He then, in combination with Gaja, completely eviscerated Magicula's body, who, mind you, was one of the Dark Triad. And this isn't just the reincarnation Dark Triad version like Dante and Xenon. This is real deal Magicula who manifested in the overworld. Magicula, who the entirety of curse magic is based off. Of. An insanely powerful foe, and he destroyed her body, leaving only a heart for Noelle and Silva to destroy. But since we're talking about Noelle, she's next up on the list. Noelle is born to one of the three noble families in the Clover Kingdom, the Silva family. 
However, Noelle, even though she has a massive amount of magical power, was never able to control it, which led to her entire family looking at her as a failure. At least that's what we're led to believe, but in reality, Silva just wanted to protect her. But because Noelle had no control over her magic, she wasn't able to join the Silver Eagles like the rest of her family. And instead, when she took the Magical Knights exam, the only person that was interested in her was Yami. See, Noelle to me is the true second protagonist of this show. She, unlike Yuno and much like Asta, started in a relatively tough situation. With an insane amount of potential, through a lot of hard work, she's been able to achieve the majority of her own potential. See, Noelle is a good representation of the fact that you can be born into an advantageous situation, but without hard work, you can still fail. See, Noelle is born into one of the most powerful families of all time, from one of the most powerful women of all time in Asier Silva, but she can barely ride a broom. However, as it stands in the Black Clover manga right now, she is unequivocally one of the strongest people on Earth. See, Noelle uses water magic. And just like with Locke and Charmy, she went to the Heart Kingdom and figured out true magic, which allows her to generate and manipulate real water. Which is good considering the fact that more often than not, Noelle uses her water magic to use creation magic. Noelle, honestly, is one of the most well-balanced mages in the entirety of the show, with abilities like Sea Dragon's Nest that act as an incredible defensive measure, and Sea Dragon's Roar that act as an incredible offensive measure. On top of this, Noelle has Valkyrie Dress, which allows her to cover herself in her own water magic to fly but it does so much more than make her fly it increases her strength her mobility her dexterity her agility and it gives her a magical water lance that she can use to impart massive physical damage against her enemies on top of this noelle can use mana zone and mana skin but the dark triad arc saw her getting much more in terms of a power up than just true magic see lola peshka is kidnapped by the dark triad and thus undine and lola peshka are separated and because Undine as a water spirit is much more powerful when she has a contract with somebody, she, in a desperate situation, makes a contract with Noelle, who she doesn't particularly like. However, that means Noelle can now tap into spirit magic. And here's the thing, while technically people like Fogolion can tap into spirit magic, Noelle and Yuno are on a different level. See, Noelle and Yuno are considered saint stage mages, meaning that they can coordinate with the spirits that they have contracts with at the highest possible level. Meaning that Noelle as a saint stage mage has abilities comparable to Yuno's, which is backed up by the fact that she was able to beat Magicula in a fight. Noelle's Saint Valkyrie dress might be the most powerful water magic in the entirety of the Black Clover universe. And when you consider the fact that this Saint Valkyrie dress is almost definitely made using mana method and therefore is comprised of real water, and the fact that Noelle's mana amount is given a five in the data book, which is the highest it can go, makes me feel as though I could have put Noelle higher on this list, honestly. But unfortunately, I'd be lying to myself if I said Noelle is actually as strong as the top three people on this list, the first of which is Noct. You see, Noct Faust is a former nobleman. You see, Noct and his twin were born to the house Faust, and they live a relatively happy life. But when Noct turns 15, he hears about a man with peculiar magic and goes to find him, and eventually stumbles upon Yami. And Yami and Noct have a ton of fun with each other, committing petty crimes and just being all around bad kids. But later that year, Yami and Noct's twin Morgan join the Grey Deer under Julius, the next Wizard King's direction. They invite Noct to join, but he doesn't. Too busy being angsty. And when Noct turns 18, his family tells him about how their family has had a long connection taming devils. And he's actually successful almost immediately and binds to four devils. Nox's family is so surprised by his abilities to bind to devils that his father gives him a bracelet that is tied to one of the highest ranking devils in the underworld, Lucifugus. However, Morgan doesn't want Nox to try and bind with this devil, afraid that this devil will kill Nox. However, Nox doesn't listen, and Nox summons the devil. However, the devil's too strong for Nox and goes on to kill the majority of Nox's family. Morgan jumps into the magical circle and destroys the bracelet sending the devil back to the underworld. However, Morgan, while doing this, sustains a fatal injury and dies in Noct's hands. And it's at this point that Noct realizes the errors of his ways. And as Noct cries at his brother's tombstone, Yami comes to him and tells Noct that he'd become the vice captain of his newly formed magical knight squad, the Black Bulls. Noct then takes the appearance of his brother and joins the Black Bulls. But why is Noct so powerful? Well, he has an incredibly powerful magical affinity. You see, Noct's magic is shadow magic, meaning that Noct can control and manipulate shadows, which works in a myriad of different and very useful ways. Noct is able to slip in and out of shadows to travel to certain people, meaning he can basically appear wherever he wants to, whenever he wants to. The only real exception to this is he can't access the shadows of dead people or people who are on different continents or other 
other dimensions. But if you're alive and on the same continent as Nock, you're fair game. On top of this, he can restrain people with shadows or immobilize anybody who steps into his shadows like Shikamaru. He can also use abilities like Shadow Corridor that essentially allow him to make a corridor of shadows that will teleport a group of people from one area to another. He's also mastered Monozone, which is why he can use abilities like Dark Prison Hunting Grounds, which allows him to make a shadowy area where all light is cut out and his key is blocked. Meaning that anybody brought into this Monozone not only can't see, but also can't sense his key. And for an ultimate move, Noct has the ability Monument of Atonement, which creates two shadowy headstones that create a Monozone around him. And these two headstones slowly but surely come into each other. And anything captured between these two headstones will be sealed forever in shadow magic. But if all of that wasn't enough, Noct has four devils that he can unionize with. Noct has Conus, Equus, Felis, and Gallus. In Conus mode, not only are Noct's physical capabilities like speed and strength greatly improved, he can use Gamoldio, the devil he unionized, with ability Pack that essentially allows him to make clones of himself. And these clones have all of Noct's abilities, on top of the fact that their key is exactly the same as Noct, so by sensing key, you can't find which is the original. In Equus form, Noct gets slaughtered Slotto's abilities. Slotto's ability is toughness, which greatly enhances the user's physical resistance to things. Using this union mode, Noct was able to stand under Dante's gravity magic. And then there's Unite Mode Felis. Felice? Maybe Felice. Where Noct takes on Plumed's abilities. Agility. I'll give you one guess what this ability does. It makes him faster and more agile. It also gives him the ability to peer through shadows, essentially allowing every shadow that exists in an area to act as a camera for Noct thus acting as an incredible information gathering tool. And then lastly, there's Gallus, which gives Nox the ability Crow. Not only does this give Nox the ability to fly, but it also gives him the ability to create a sound that paralyzes those who hear it. And this worked on Lilith and Nahama, two of the highest ranking devils in the underworld. But enough about using devil's powers, that's cheating, which is why we gotta respect the second place entry on this list, Yami. You see, Yami is a foreigner from Hino Country, aka Japan. Hino Country is also translated as the land of the rising sun, kind of like Japan's flag. A place filled with fishers where katanas are made. You make the guess. Yami, while fishing as a 13-year-old, got capsized on his boat and washed up in the Clover Kingdom. But now nobody really likes Yami because of like, well, racism and also he had weird magic. But there was one person who was incredibly intrigued by his magic and that was Julius Novacrono. And Julius, seeing his potential, invited him to join the Great Deer, which is where he served for about three years until he formed his own magical knight squad, the Black Bulls. So Yami has one of the most powerful types of magic on earth because Yami has dark magic, which allows him to generate and manipulate the concept of darkness. It goes beyond shadow magic because shadows have to actually be present to be controlled and manipulated. Well, Yami can create actual darkness. And since Yami is very much from Japan, all of his abilities are funneled through his katana. But here's the thing about the darkness. It absorbs everything. And thus, Yami also has somewhat anti-magic capabilities, because Yami's magic is able to pull in and nullify all other types of magic, most specifically light magic. But Yami's dark magic is also so powerful that it's able to affect the other world, that is to say different dimensions or the underworld, which is why he was stolen to act as a battery of sorts for the tree of Quella. Quella Quellaferoth? I've never had to say it out loud. Oh, I was way off. It's the tree of Clipoth. But Yami has been shown to use his dark magic in a myriad of ways. While most of them are sword slashes, the most powerful of which being his dark cloaked dimension slash, which is when he coats his blade in dark magic so powerful that it literally cuts through dimensions. Yami can also create black holes or black moons. And the creation of a black hole is basically exactly what it sounds like. It's a super massive gravity object that pulls in all opposing magic or even allied magic. Black moon is an iteration of the black hole that applies monozone to it. That is to say that essentially a monozone is created by the black hole that will pull in all opposing magic. Now I say opposing magic because the black moon can actually select what magic is absorbed and what magic isn't, leaving allied magic untouched while opponent's magic is absorbed, which leads me to saying that Yami has mastered monozone. He's also mastered union magic with Noct, which makes sense considering Noct uses shadow magic and Yami uses darkness magic, and they use abilities like kids playground and doppelganger, the latter of which is when Noct pulls both of them 
into the shadow and teleports them behind an enemy and they attack the enemy simultaneously. Yami being up this high shouldn't be much of a surprise. He basically single-handedly defeated an 80% Dante. Obviously, Asta was there and the rest of the Black Bulls, but when it came down to it, Yami was doing the heavy lifting. He also used his Dark Cloak Dimension Slash to literally cut Zagred in half. Not to mention, Yami blocked one of Lucifero's punches with a wooden sword. Yami is also impaled by Lucifero and survives, and was able to fight on somewhat even footing with Lucifero, even though he has no devil unions. Yami is unequivocally the strongest non-devil union user on Earth. Well, what about Julius? Well... But speaking of Devil Union users, obviously number one on the list is Asta. Now, some people will argue that the strongest person on this list should be Yami, but let's not forget who cut Lucifero into a bunch of little pieces. Asta has now perfected his union with Liebe, and while he can only maintain it for five seconds, those five seconds were enough for him to speed rush and literally dice Lucifero into a bunch of little meat chunks. Now, obviously, Lucifero came back from this and was about to kill everybody until Noct, Yami, Yuno, and Asta came together and used the power of friendship to finish off Lucifero. Basically, what happened was Yuno teleported Lucifero on under Asta's sword swing, which decapitated Lucifero and killed him. But I mean, like, who are we kidding here? In a non-perfected devil union, Asta 1v1'd an ancient demon. You know, like the one that Leek turned into that the first Wizard King had to fight? Yeah, one of those is attacking the Clover Kingdom during the Dark Triad arc. And all of the wizards that were left behind can't seem to beat it. That is until Asta flies in with his demon destroyer and quite literally bisects it in one attack. And this was a non-perfected devil union. Asta is now many times stronger than that. So much so that he was basically the only person on Earth capable capable of injuring Lucifero, the literal king of devils. And it's all because of his anti-magic. You see, Asta has three anti-magic swords that come from his five-leaf clover grimoire. Now, obviously, these three anti-magic swords are tied into Libe, who was the only devil in the underworld to be born without magic. And when Libe was thrown into the overworld by upper ranking demons, he embodied this grimoire. Now, these are obviously the demon slayer sword, the demon slasher sword, and the demon dweller sword, all of which have different abilities. On top of this, Asta is quite possibly the most physically strong person in the entire Black Clover universe. And he's mastered key, which gives him a sixth scent that allows him to track where people are on the battlefield without physically seeing them. Oh wait, he also has the Demon Destroyer. How did I forget the Demon Destroyer? That was the first one. So he's got four swords, okay? The fourth sword's kind of a new thing. And yeah, I could go into Asta's backstory, but you know it already. Basically, the only thing important for talking about ranking of the Black Bulls is the fact that he quite literally was the only person who was able to injure Lucifera. I mean, like, to a mortal degree. And yeah, that's it. All of the Black Bulls ranked and explained. Do you guys agree with my rankings? If you do, tell me in the comments below and while you guys are down there, please, for me, like this video, subscribe to the page, and hit that noti bell. Am I gonna go back to back on the Weeb Commander of 30 plus minute videos? I absolutely am. You're welcome.